According to the Japanese, the five great terrors are earthquakes, thunders, floods, fires, and father. And to most of them, I imagine, father is the principal cause of anxiety. But these people, incidentally, have on average are from 1,200 to 1,500 earthquakes a year. Therefore, it is only natural that they've given some thought to the matter. And while their thinking is perhaps a little empirical, it may be well to consider it for a moment and see if we can learn something that is a little different from the present approach to the problems of these seismic catastrophes. The Japanese believe that earthquakes are caused by a catfish. Now, this is perhaps an exaggeration, but it is called the pivot fish, and it is somewhere asleep under Japan. And every once in a while it wiggles and shakes its tail, and down comes a city or two. And this has resulted in a peculiar love for catfish. About six months ago, there was a a prophecy in Japan of a serious impending earthquake. What happened? Everybody that could do so bought a catfish. (laughs) Instead of moving or anything of that nature, they found either a little pond or a bowl or a tank or something and put the catfish in it. And thousands of years of experience has taught them that the first thing that will note or register an impending earthquake is a catfish. The moment that fish gets excited, hysterical, wiggles around and tries to jump out of the tank, every one of the villagers head for the bamboo groves. They know an earthquake is coming, and it comes. Now, this led to a series of interesting experiments concerning the possibility of the foreknowledge of earthquakes. We are inclined to suspect at the present time that sonar or radar or something of that nature is the factor that causes animals, birds, and other non-human creatures to have better awareness of earthquake difficulties than the average human being. Uh, But in the Orient, there's another factor involved that seems to be worthwhile to consider. Some years ago, about the middle of the 19th century, uh, a Japanese watch repairer, had the habit of hanging the small parts of a an, of an watch's mechanism on magnets to keep them so he could get them when he wanted them and they wouldn't get lost or disappear. One day, while he was hard at work with one of his watches, all of these magnets discharged the pieces hung on them. And there was a little crash of small parts falling on his workbench. He didn't pay much attention to it at that moment. But about ten minutes later, the earthquake hit. So this began to be a matter of consideration. The villagers picked it up, and they had a burglar, an earthquake alarm, that probably is one of the earliest that we know. This consisted of a large iron ball hung from a magnet. And below the ball was a bronze or iron dish, large, like a great uh, boiler. And the warning was that if the ball dropped on the metal dish and made a loud noise, it was a good idea for the people to head for the bamboo grove. Why the bamboo grove? Obviously because the roots of the bamboo not into tangles that are so tight that the ground can open under them and the roots will hold up anyone who is hanging onto the roots. So this was a way in which they began to experiment with uh, earthquake phenomena. And, of course, with the susceptibility of that country, such research and such study was certainly important. It may be that, like acupuncture and several other oriental methods of handling situations, we will ultimately have more interest, not necessarily in iron balls or detached magnets, but in the general theory that they have, namely, that an earthquake is always heralded by a form of natural magnetism being disarranged. This disarrangement, however, is not followed instantly by the earthquake. It may be followed within an hour or so, or it may be followed the next day. 
But the warning is almost always ultimately met with an appropriate termination. There is an earthquake. Years ago, it was noted that animals had peculiar ability to anticipate earthquakes. There was a very important quake off the coast of Peru, and a large part of the coastline fell into the sea. This coastline had for years been a grazing ground for cattle. They grazed free in this area. When it fell off into the sea, there was not a single cap- head of cattle lost. They had all quietly left. And many other such accounts are known to to anticipate the possibility that earthquakes are perhaps a magnetic phenomena, as well as possibly a physical one. Some have assumed, and there's been some scientific support for this, that an earthquake begins in the heavy heavy side layer of the atmosphere, that it is very much like a discharge of lightning. It is something which, as energy, strikes an area where the fission lines of the planet are particularly susceptible. This blow, this stroke of energy, results in a motion of the physical earth. Now, trying to work out some of these uh, mysteries, we go back to Plato's account of the sinking of Atlantis. He was very simple in his repetition of the information received from Solon, who, who's, who in turn had gained it from the Egyptians. Uh, according to Plato, the great Atlantic catastrophe was a punishment for sin. It was the way in which the gods avenged the abuse and misuse of the privileges and powers which they had bestowed upon mankind. The corruption of human usage, the misuse of earth energies, the pollution of earth resources, we would say could, in the end, of course, bring about such a disaster. But to the Greeks, it was not only brought about, but it was ordered, arranged, and fulfilled by divine will. The gods were responsible for punishing the guilty. Looking into the problems as we know them in our daily life, the uh, ancients, particularly following the hermetic disciplines, believe that the microcosm, which is man, was a miniature of all other things that exist in nature, and that the human being was the most available textbook for the study of of any type of phenomena that can arise in the larger environment. We know very much now concerning the causes of sickness. Not all, but quite a bit. We know also the effect of dispositions upon health. We realize how the abuse or misuse or corruption of human emotions or thoughts will ultimately destroy the body. We also realize how excesses and the abuse of the natural resources of the body can result in premature infirmity. All of these factors are more or less generally recognized. But how would we apply such a situation or such a condition to the larger world in which we live, the universal environment? To the ancients, one and all, east and west, the planet Earth was considered to be a living thing. It was not just simply a mass of metals or substances or lava or rocks, whirling around in space. It was a being with uh, with the attributes of a being. And one of their reasons for assuming this is that nothing can produce nothing. And the fact that this planet maintains an infinite diversity of life dependent upon the planet would make it appear or be assumed that the planet itself was a source of life and therefore must be alive, for that which is dead cannot be the source of life. Now, the planet itself, if we want to consider it as a living thing, which practically all of ancient people did, they considered it a goddess, the great mother of all life, and that from this great mother 
came forth all of the kingdoms of material existence in this world. That the planet Earth was the great nurse, the mother. It was the bride of the sun and the, and the daughter or wife of God. It was the symbol of the productiveness and fruitfulness of existence so far as the human being was concerned. Assuming as the ancients did, and perhaps with uh, proper insight, better than we have, because we are now determined to make everything sterile, mechanical, physical, material, and to deny all other factors in the constitutions of living things. The ancients did not have this point of view, and someone will say, well... Maybe we outgrew what the ancients thought. Maybe they were superstitious and wrong, and we are right. But let us give a second thought to that. Most of the wisdom of antiquity originated before what we may call the age of sophistication. Ancient peoples were simple. They'd had very little to unlearn. They were not surrounded by highly opinionated specialists who were constantly interfering with the natural processes of the heart and mind. They were not overwhelmed by schools. They were not dominated by widespread theories. They were not made up primarily of scoffers or cynics. They were very simple, natural people, and their wisdom was the wisdom of the folk. Now the folk, perhaps, in its wisdom, like the folk in its art, has a tremendous integrity. It represents the natural reaction of the individual directed and moved by common sense and by the common experiences of daily life. Therefore, the primitive instincts and intuitions of humanity may well be more correct than the sophisticated, involved doctrines and beliefs that we hold to today. In any event the ancient peoples were inclined to think of the earth as a living thing. It was not simply a footstool for deity, nor was it merely some kind of a meteor floating in space. It was a being, part of a great hierarchy of beings inhabiting space. Uh, the Buddhists called this great space family a cosmotheism, and they said that it was a vast, cosmic space democracy. That in this was all the law that man could possibly need or use. That every aspect of life that was necessary for the protection and unfoldment of human society was already traced in the universe itself. And that there was no way in which we could go against the universe and survive, or at least survive with dignity. Now, assuming for a moment that the earth is alive, at least it is vital. It may not have a disposition like ours, although sometimes it seems to be almost miraculously wise and clever. It seems to have abilities to solve problems that human beings cannot solve. One thing we know definitely is that the earth, as the alchemist pointed out, is a kind of great bottle. And in this bottle is an, an infinite mixture of chemical factors. This bottle contains within it all of the elements necessary for the production of the philosopher's stone, or the transmutations of all gross substances into their mystical and spiritual equivalents. Now, if this uh, planet is a bottle, then, like all other bottles, it has capacity. Like all other bottles, it can only be filled, and it can only be emptied. And unless something is taken from it, no more can be added once it is full. And if there is no source for the replenishment of the contents of the bottle, then when it is empty, that is the end. So at the moment, uh, some people, including a number of Chinese researchers, are beginning to question whether or not man is wise in constantly exploiting the natural resources of the earth. Is it perfectly pleasant, happy, safe, and sound, and quite in the order of things, 
to drain out petroleum? Is it proper to go on mining for the natural metals and elements of the earth? Is it possible to go through all kinds of processes of transformations resulting in corruption of the atmosphere and pollution of the water? What are we doing to this tired old person that we call the earth? If it is really a person, it is in a pretty poor shape and is getting poorer all the time. Now we know that the gravitational pull of the earth and its relation to the sun and the orbits of the other planets that this, these are controlled factors. And these controlled factors, in all probability, depend upon the, in, the internal construction of the earth itself. It has to have certain polarities. It has to have certain resources in order to remain in its orbit as it should. If human ingenuity depletes the natural resources and energies of the planet until nothing remains... Its fertility is very apt to be destroyed, and it may sometime, like the broken planet, uh, which is now called Lucifer, uh, be disintegrated in space, because it has been exhausted of its resources. Come down to the human being. It may be occasionally necessary for a man to give a little blood to a neighbor who is in trouble, so there's a blood transfusion. But if this individual was required to give transfusions every day throughout his life, he'd be dead in a few weeks. And if we take from the earth the vital necessities by a kind of transfusion and then dissipate them in our own industrialized culture, we are ultimately going to land in a very serious disaster. And this disaster can can include nearly every type of cataclysm because of the various forms of depletion of which we are guilty. Now, there's no real need to get terribly excited about this, perhaps, because it's not likely to happen in our lifetimes, or maybe for many more centuries to come. But unless something is done to conserve resources, there is no question in the world that ultimately the energy bottle will be empty. And when that happens, we are going to find many very difficult situations to face. If you study the human being very carefully, you must realize also that the microcosm, which is man, is a little solar system in in itself. There are planets within the human body, and to the various vital organs, planetary correspondences have been assigned. There are also various systems within the body, which can be separated by the uh, autopsy physician. There is the nervous system. There is the arterial system, the venous system, the lymphatic system. There are muscles and sinews and bones, systems of structures, which by working together and receiving appropriate nutrition, maintain the equilibrium of man's physical existence. Now, if various artificial means are used to corrupt the health of the individual, these systems are going to be impaired. And through various dissipations or indifferences or wrong attitudes, uh, the entire bodily structure can be damaged. Actually, it appears also that the human being has a territorial allotment, like the tiger, the lion, the elephant, and the bear. When he sets up headquarters somewhere, he sets aside a territory. And within this territory, he must exist, he must feed himself and is young, he must do whatever is necessary to survive, and he must defend this territory against encroachment. In man, what we would term the territory, may be likened to the magnetic field of the human body. The ancients were well aware of this, Plato, Plutarch, and several others have written about it, and they have also noted that the physical body of man exists within a kind of invisible bubble which has been called in metaphysics the aura. This has been photographed. It can be seen with the aid of the Kilner screens, and its effect in terms of magnetism can be estimated with great certainty. And in his researches, Rickenbach was very clear in his ability to show and demonstrate the magnetic environment around every living thing. Now, if the human body has a magnetic field, then this magnetic field becomes the real source 
of the life of that body. This magnetic field envelops uh, the physical form. It is the source of that form. It is the direct energizer of it. The life in man is not within the body, but within the magnetic field. And it communicates with the body through a series of very sensitive structures of which the endocrine system is an example. This body, which contains uh, the vital organs that we know, is therefore surrounded by a territory. That part of universal space which is allotted to the growth, development, and maintenance of a single creature. Uh, everyone has this type of magnetic field. And it has been used in a number of interesting ways. It not only is apparent from an energy standpoint, but is probably responsible for most of the parapsychological phenomena that we know today, much of which we accept without question. It is probably involved in the system of acupuncture. It is involved in the yin-yang concepts of the Tao Te King and all of these ancient systems. For our purpose at the moment, though, the idea is that this bottle, which is the magnetic field, not only encloses us, but serves as a kind of capacity which we have. Our mental, emotional, and physical activities reflect into this. Our thoughts go into this magnetic field, change its color, change its structure, and can in many instances damage it. Our emotional pressures do the same thing. And photographing and studying the magnetic fields, as Kilner did, reveals clearly that the emotions and attitudes of persons change the colors of the magnetic field, change the vibratory rates of this auric structure in which we exist. If this, these auric rates are damaged by negative attitudes, it may, it's hard to imagine, for instance, that uh, a neurotic attitude could cause rheumatic situations in the body. It probably couldn't unless this attitude that went first into the magnetic field and then was then siphoned into the body through one of the endocrine glands. In any event, we have a physical body that is extremely sensitive uh, to the law of cause and effect. Every attitude that we have has its own life principle. Words and thoughts are living things. And they feed into the magnetic field. And from there are fed back again into the uh, body of the person. We find the same type of problem in smog. The Earth's atmosphere accepts the smog of industry and then returns it with interest, bringing with it a condition which is desperately dangerous to human survival. The same way with all of the inventions and discoveries of man. Everything by which man endangers the integrity of his own integration is dangerous to the common good and to his own personal survival. So in this magnetic field, there is a chemistry constantly going on. And this chemistry does react into the body. And a a series of wrong attitudes will result in a detriment to the physical form. In the same way, wrong physical habits, as narcotics, alcohol, and other forms of dissipation, these variously deplete and disorganize the energy field. And when the energy field is sick, it is very difficult for the person to break the physical habit. Because the habit is not in his body, but in the magnetic field where he has built it up by constant repetition of the mistake. So we have this to think of in human beings. Now let's move this out into the universe. Let us assume, as Ptolemy uh, pointed out and most of the ancients, that the earth has a magnetic field that this magnetic field surrounds and involves the substance of the planet and carries within it not only its own impressions, but a certain contribution that is made from other magnetic fields. Energy enters the human magnetic field through the crown of the head and above it and goes out at the bottom. The planetary magnetic field is nourished through the polar cap 
at the north and the excretion of destroyed, disintegrated or useless material is through the south polar cap. The aurora borealis and the aurora australasia are evidences of the motion of magnetism through the earth. And sometimes this motion is extraordinary. Then we see that the earth itself is a kind of bottle we contained within a larger vessel, which is its own magnetic field. And everything that has to do with the preservation of the earth itself, everything that has to do with the development of the earth and its various policies and processes, take, these things take place within the magnetic field, which incidentally extends beyond the orbit of the moon. Therefore, the solar energy entering the earth surf system, also comes in through the polar region, which was supposed to be the abode of the gods and the Mount Olympus or the Mount Miru or the Simuru of India. It was from the north, therefore, that this energy flows in through the sacred island of the Gobina. So we have a great magnetic structure here, which is being continually influenced by human activity. Now, we know that the human being is a comparatively small fraction of earth life. But if we think of uh, the human being, perhaps, as a little like the locust, or a little like the marching ants, we learn in time that these little creatures, in infinite multiplication, can completely desolate a continent. (coughs) That the major grand motions of humanity which gradually infect every nation and every race, constitute a very powerful magnetic force. A great many people today are quite convinced that spiritual healing is possible through the laying on of hands, through prayer, through meditation, or through the cultivation of knowledge of the magnetic structure of the body. This was perhaps very well set forth in the writings of Andrew Jackson Davis, the New England physician. In any event, this process of increasing contamination uh, must not be completely overlooked. But now, because of the nature of the scoffer, who is always with us, and is a useful agent, there's no doubt in the world that the devil's advocate plays a vital part in human progress. But the question is, what caused earthquakes before there were human beings? This is a very good one it helps us to get rid of the responsibilities of our own conduct and make everything look better. There is no doubt in the world that in the very primitive period of things, we have situations very much again like we have in the development of the human being. We have many forces from the outside working upon the prenatal epoch of a planet. We also have, as with growth, the processes through which a planet passes in the process of its own maturity. Therefore, at the very primitive times, it would seem that most natural disasters were partly due to the birth travail of a planet, that these disasters resulted from the constant bombardment of this planet with the forces uh, that made it into a planet. But uh, even in comparatively older times, we find there were several different kinds of disasters. One might well be the one that we find in the human being, where heredity becomes a disaster. We know that the life principle of the planet uh, lives here, but was was carried here from another location in space. This is merely an incarnation of an entity, this planet. This incarnation had its own karma. It had its own problems to work out. And this is true also in various kinds of birth problems that we have and note at the present time. But actually, the obvious solution seems to be that before the planet was inhabited, there were no creatures as we know them to be affected by these transmissions of energy. Therefore, no one was hurt, no one was killed, but the planet in its great processes of integration Uh, went through these formative periods. Back as far as history, however, goes, two processes go side by side. One is human corruption, and the other is natural disaster. They are intimately related from the beginning of human thought. And we know that a great many 
ancient peoples were troubled uh, by earthquake phenomena. Unfortunately, we have very few records of very ancient earthquakes. The most ancient that we do have records of are in the records of China, which kept these accounts more closely because it carried them into its astronomical system and was already aware of the cycles of the year and the great platonic year. So the uh, problems that we face are very largely those which involve humanity as it is at the present time. We know, for instance, that a few terrorists or anarchists or even an individual who is corrupted can cause a tremendous amount of world damage. A few discontented, uh, uninformed or misinformed human beings can bring terror and sorrow to the lives of millions of people. This type of phenomena seems also to be carried into the earth structure, and there seems to be no reason to doubt that human attitudes do have an effect upon natural phenomena as well as social and political phenomena. If the selfishness of people can cause planet, cause nations to lose their individuality, and great and powerful states usurp the privileges and rights of smaller but equally meritorious peoples, then it is obvious that a small number of persons can produce a startling and dangerous physical phenomena. And this is likewise true if we think of the larger things. The attitudes of four and a half billion human beings brought together in various patterns and around various confusions can certainly damage the Earth's atmosphere and affect its magnetic field. That which we can allow, allow to be affected by smog or water pollution would be the atmosphere, but that which is affected by psychic pollution would be the magnetic field, and both will be subject to trouble and even the cause of further trouble unless the conditions are corrected by proper and watchful guidance. The answer again in this matter seems to be very simple. There are laws governing life. When we break these laws, we bring upon ourselves inevitable retribution. This was the concept of Plato and the New Atlantis. We cannot misuse without suffering. Now, the ignorance of very primitive people caused their abuses and misuses to be comparatively simple. They made their mistakes. They invented clubs and bows and arrows and slingshots. But they were comparatively sparse in number, and at the time probably at which the prehistoric man was most dangerous to himself, the population of the earth probably was less than 50 million human beings. Today, it is four and a half billion. This tremendous increase also increases the effect of human attitudes upon the planet, causing it to become more and more involved in the various processes set in motion by human activity. Actually, therefore, it's not surprising to find out that earthquakes have been uh, rather frequent recently. They have always existed in fair numbers, and mostly they follow a certain cycle or circle of location. Most of the great earthquakes of the world have been Asiatic. They have also been along the great cycle which we call uh, the uh, circle of fire which bounds the Pacific Ocean. In these areas, earthquakes have always been comparatively frequent. Actually, however, we do not realize just exactly how serious or how constant the damage is. According to available statistics, in the present century, between 1901 and 1982, the loss of life by earthquakes on this planet has exceeded one and a half million. This uh, tremendous loss of life by this one cause alone is a cause of considerable thoughtfulness. Studying the statistics also, we observe that there is a distinct relationship between these earthquakes and attitudes and problems arising in human society we find that great motions of political structure, particularly when accompanied by violence, murder, rape, and carnage, that such motions are almost inevitably followed 
by some form of seismic disaster, or, if not that, a plague, a pestilence, a drought, a flood, or some natural evidence of divine disapproval. This type of situation is so consistent that it uh, it really behooves us to be more thoughtful than we are inclined to be. Actually, also, there must be and is a direct relationship between the earthquake phenomena and the broad cycle of human activity. Since the middle of the 19th century, the world in all has moved slowly but inevitably into an industrial economy. The small shop with the man behind his own bench for life has disappeared. Great monopolies have arisen, vast combines and conspiracies, and little by little, uh, the world has become almost completely involved in a desperate economic materialism. Nothing means anything except profit. Now, when a person gets into this situation, he gets into trouble too. All over this world today, there are people suffering from nothing but the pressure of present prevailing policies. They are shortening life, destroying happiness, depriving the person of the privilege of improving himself through thoughtfulness and proper activities. Little by little, he is being bound to the wheel of Ixion, which is turning constantly upon an economic pivot. As a result of this situation the whole world level of consciousness is lowering. Now, this in itself, of course, is part of natural law, because the lowering of these cultural levels also produces discords, unhappiness, misery, privation, sickness, mental and emotional breakdown, the increase of crime, and the shortening of life expectancy. All of these things, therefore, result from a wrong basic attitude toward life. If nature had really intended to be on the profit system, it could have made a moderate charge for each of us when we came in here. Nature could have dictated that each individual had to offer something upon the altar in recognition of his own birth. But in nature, all of the good things that we enjoy are essentially free. The only cost lies in the distribution distribution of them. But gradually, things have become valuable in their own right. We have taken possession of natural resources as though we owned them, when in actuality we do not own them, any more than we own our own body, which can be destroyed by a few drops of some type of toxin. Therefore, we are always living in a natural world, which we are exploiting and trying to divert to our own purposes. We want to industrialize the earth. We want to have a commuter in every family. We want to have everything all lined into a purely industrial profit-making process. We do not mind how many people we displace with machines. We do not give much consideration to the production of the higher types of life that we desperately need for leadership. We are corrupted in our entertainment and in our literature. Everything has been sacrificed. Now, when we get to a state of this kind, something is going to happen because of this mysterious factor that Plato calls the gods. If we do not wish to assume that they are gods, that is our privilege. But we must at least accept the immutability of natural law. And to the ancients, the will of God was natural law, because the laws of nature, according to them, arose in the divine consciousness. Therefore, there are rules in the game. And wherever the rules have been broken, there has been disaster. Wherever we desperately attempt to protect, preserve, and exaggerate these mistakes, the disasters increase. Humanity gradually undermines its own securities and its own health. We are troubled today with crime, with everything you can think of, that is disastrous and annoying. And yet, Uh, We overlook all this because of the tremendous drive of success, which has become an obsession with most human beings. All right, we do this, and gradually we are going to wreck four and a half billion human beings. Maybe by the time we wreck them, 
there'll be more than that. Maybe there'll be five or six billion. But they will be born into a kind of psychological slavery. They will have no thinking of their own. They will have no will and purpose of their own. Everyone will be bowing constantly and eternally to profit. This type of situation affects not only ourselves, but our relation with the animal world. We are completely disturbing our ecology. We are everything there that nature set up as the chain of nutritions, the, tra- cha- uh, the change of propagations, all these things are being disrupted, endangered, and nullified. Almost wherever we have a field where we should be growing tomatoes, we're putting a condominium on it. Little by little, we are sitting on the end of a branch and cutting it off between ourselves and the tree. This type of thing cannot go on without an, an, a natural reaction that will be painful but inevitable. For four and a half billion people, all making more or less the same mistakes, certainly will have an effect upon the atmosphere. This atmosphere, in our own more intimate associations, becomes a contaminated life vitality source. When we breathe, we not only breathe in the smog, but in a mysterious way, in the abstract life energy inhalation, we breathe in the corruption, we breathe in the perversions which are dominant in our world. Our very uh, water, earth, air, all these things are affected adversely by our own ignorance, stupidity, and avarice. So we are getting constantly polluted nutrition. Now our little problem is tied in to a bigger one. There is a food chain that leads all the way to the sun and the stars. There is a certain natural distribution of life energy which was preordained and made necessary by laws far beyond our comprehension. We only live because we are part of a chain of laws which will provide us as long as we do not corrupt them. So the earth itself is a source of energy for man, and man's conduct becomes a kind of karmic reaction which goes into the atmosphere of the planet. The magnetic field of the planet is much more subtle than the physical. In the physical field, we are polluting it day and night. In the more subtle ideological fields, we are also polluting those day and night. We are gradually corrupting the source of energies upon which we depend for survival. As this source of energy is corrupted, we notice a corresponding depression in our affairs. Obviously, the highest forms of our energy supply are the first to be sickened. The more attenuated, the more subtle, uh, the more difficult, the more rare and valuable perish first. Therefore, little by little, the mind loses the power for the higher phases of thinking which are so necessary to it. The emotions lose the nutrition which breeds love and friendship. The body loses the energy to recuperate from pressures. And on all these levels, we have tried to substitute artificial uh, factors for the natural ones. And when every, whenever some essential function fails, we try to remedy it through medication, psychoanalysis, or something of that nature. Now, when you get this four and a half billion, plus the sickened bodies of all the other kingdoms that have been made sick by us, and pour all this corruption into the energy and magnetic field, it is assumed that by the circulation of the solar energy, that this can be all purified, uh, just as we would have uh, it in the case of the earth. But the sun was not given to us primarily to be the head of a sewerage system. There are certain inevitable natural wastes which the sun can can control. There are certain psychological wastes which are suitable to be controlled by the lunar ray. But there are many forms of artificial corruption pouring out into space all the time from this busy, dizzy little planet, which will make it very difficult to, um, to permit the proper distribution of the nutrition chain, so far as we are concerned. As this process goes further and further, and we dig more and more deeply into the earth, depleting its resources, we don't realize 
what uh, some of the ancients knew, namely, that man is connected to the solar system by planetary polarities and metallic elemental polarities in the earth. In other words, in order for the rays from its outer space to reach us constructively, there has to be a polarization of those rays in the planet itself. And for these rays from the planet to reach us, there must be a personal polarity in each of us to receive all of these energies. And these polarities are magnetic attractors. They are factors by means of which the ray reaches us because there is something of itself in us. And in the earth there are all the metals, all the elements, all the various colors, sounds, and everything by means of which these rays from other areas of space have their polarities here and can contribute to our well-being. These rays have to work in the human body. They also have to work in the earth. The Egyptians symbolized the planet earth by the cross-section of an onion, and they pointed to these concentric rings and pointed out that there was a solar system inside of the earth, just as there is a solar system of which the earth is a member. This solar system within the earth it has its planetary equivalents in the elements and polarities by which we are united, not only with the solar system, but with the cosmic system. So if we begin to destroy these polarities, if we corrupt them, if we maliciously mutilate the planet, if we do everything that we can to turn it into a garbage heap, we are gradually going to come to a conclusion that we're not going to like very well. We're going to find out that our own thoughtlessness, selfishness, and self-centeredness are doing us a very serious injustice. I remember when, uh, in Japan the last time, uh, I uh, went to the great Meiji Shrine in Tokyo. The Meiji Shrine is an enormous park open to the public. It is the place where most picnics and many weddings are given. It is a beautiful grounds and dedicated to the memory of the Emperor Meiji and his Empress, who the two, the two who brought Japan out of medievalism into the modern world. Uh, if you walk along there, you will notice that while there are thousands of people picnicking and enjoying it and children playing and everything you can think of, you will never see a scrap of paper, an empty can, one single bit of rubbish in that park. I saw a man walking in that park with a camera. He changed his film and put the film back in his pocket, the empty part. But in putting it back, part of the inner lining fell onto the walkway. He didn't see it. He walked a few feet when a Japanese gentleman came up to him, bowed to him, and handed him the piece of paper. Nothing. One of the beginnings of recognition of integrities is to preserve and protect the beauty of the world in which you live. That beauty is not just something that's pretty. That beauty moving inside of you becomes a powerful factor in your own integration. Where the loss of beauty is noted in the outside of our environment, something is lost within ourselves also. So if this world, so to say, is a great shrine, which really it is, and uh, we, it is sacred, this world is sacred, it is sacred to the laws and principles, whether we are theological or not, which are immutable and inevitably and inevitable and must be obeyed. So, if we learn to keep the world beautiful, we gain a great deal. If we learn, for instance, that the rights of nations, just because they are small, cannot be violated with impunity. If we realize that all success based upon the bodies of the dead is no success at all and never can be, little by little we can organize the world in which we live and we can clean the Aegean stable of our own planetary aura. We can give the magnetic field of the earth a house cleaning and we can do it by each person giving himself a house cleaning mentally first so that all this corruption does not go out into the larger atmosphere of things. The corrupt individual may turn around and accidentally or intentionally murder his neighbor. The corrupt 
nation may destroy the sovereign rights of other people. And a corrupted earth can fall apart. Now, I believe we're going to find that uh, this has a distinct bearing upon house cleanings of various kinds. Of course, the greatest house cleaning on the planet that we have record of uh, was, was the bubonic plague, which uh, destroyed a large part of Europe. It is not known, of course, exactly how many perished in the plague, but the population of the earth itself was very much smaller in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. And the plague ran for over 300 years with recurrent attacks. It is estimated conservatively that that, the bubonic plague took about 55 million lives. It is the greatest natural disaster of all time. And what was the cause of it? Well, Nostradamus came about with a very good answer. Of course, nobody listened to him. They didn't care what he thought. Uh, the plague was either an accident of providence or the will of God for those who did not go to church regularly. Nostradamus said, no. You got outside of this town, which has been visited every time there's been a plague, it's had a visitation, a stagnant pool. You have dirt. You have poor sewerage. You have all these things. You do not have any sense of keeping your own environment clean. There is where your trouble lies. They paid no attention to him. Finally, it was discovered that these, that the plague was carried by rats. Infected rats. And we are told that the bubonic plague could still come back if we were not careful and watchful in shipments from other countries. But we are careful, and we are watchful. Also, when we go along, we find that perhaps one of the most dissipated areas in Europe, at the time, about the time of the Christian era, and slightly after, was Pompeii and Herculaneum. These were the summer resorts of the wealthy Romans. These were the places where the elite gathered to dissipate. It was a cruel, wealthy, fashionable area, burdened with most vices known to man, including the most terrible games in the amphitheaters involving human life, where nobody cared about anything, that most of the people were there, drank themselves under the table at all the banquets, and life was just one big grand vacation with a good time by, by all. And then the great Vesuvius erupted. And in a few hours, it was all gone. Pompeii was covered with ashes to a depth of many feet, whereas Herculaneum was in the lava range and was partly buried by lava. Nothing remained of these play towns no, it was not uh, the only ones. There was a Calabria earthquake in Italy in which a complete city disappeared and the ground closed over it. And travelers a few miles away saw the city and then saw a great cloud rise in the air and when it settled, there was simply no city, not even a ruin. The earth completely closed over it. Now, it's hard to understand why these things happen, but it is true. And by watching your records that nearly always there is an earthquake and plague and climatic maxima wherever there is a mass of human folly. That the more cruel man is, the more likely it is for him to have these troubles. Now, just for example, I picked out a few. I didn't want to take chances on remembering them. Of things that have happened in the present century, no earlier, that I think are very... Uh, important and uh, should be given a little consideration, maybe more than that are give, that is given now. You all remember the great Chinese leap into tomorrow, as was inspired by Mao. We also know the whole story of the long march by means of which uh, Mao came into power. Now we do not wish to belittle what Mao has accomplished for the people that might be good. But what he did to many people was a pretty tragic thing. Millions died in that 
Reformation, so called. The Reformation itself completely failed. And what was begun in 1975 and 76 was practically all lost. In China, in Tenzing, in 1976, is the second greatest earthquake catastrophe known. It came right in the midst of this big leap into the future. It took in China 700,000 lives. It, it was one of the most important or terrible of all earthquakes. The earthquakes in India and Assam were very interesting also. They came in the midst of the reconstruction of Indian philosophy at a very critical time in 1950. At that time, there were only 1,500 deaths, which is rather a minor uh, earthquake. But devastated areas extended over 30,000 square miles. The only reason it was a small earthquake is because there were no inhabitants there. In the 1920s, when China was emerging uh, in the formation of its present government, there was the Kansu earthquake in 1920 that took 180,000 lives. Nearly all of these earthquakes follow or are associated with war. And uh, they are very in much increasing now in uh, areas where all this disturbance is occurring. We might note that in 1978 in Iran, there was a serious earthquake that took 25,000 lives, and since that there's been another one. The revolution and the earthquake seem to be closely related. All the mysterious sorrows and tragedies of Latin America may be understood in terms of earthquakes. In 1960, for example, there was a series of earthquakes within a day or two of each other that struck Chile, Japan, and Hawaii with a property damage of 650 millions. Now, of course, that time and the ones that have followed are accompanying the tremendous outbreak of violence throughout the Latin American countries. The moment we break the peace, we either have plagues, or crop failures, or earthquakes. And uh, maybe that's because we have entirely lost all of the terror for Father. We are not doing any of the things that hold a world together. Inconsistency breaks a home. The broken home is a source of misery for generations. World inconsistency breaks the surface of the earth in desolation and carnage. And this goes on and has results for ages to come. We are still fighting the consequences of the wars of Caesar and Alexander, and for a long time to come we will fight the wars of Napoleon and Hitler. The tremendous consequences of these things, the whole theory is wrong, and nature will never support wrong. It won't support it in our personal lives, it won't support it in our national existence, it won't support it in world economy. We are a very fortunate people in many senses of the world word. This planet is an exceedingly pleasant place by nature. It has its troubles. Everything does. There is no perfection in this world or we wouldn't deserve to live here. And uh, uh, there are very few people who expect perfection. But we have here the raw materials for the building of the greatest and most constructive commonwealth the world has ever known. We have the potential here to have everything that is necessary for decency, uh, for security, for the development of arts and sciences, for the extensions of creativity in every field of life. We have all that it takes to build a good world. We were made gardeners in the Garden of Eden, so said. We lived here, so according to the ancient rites, until we made mistakes ourselves and got expelled. But we didn't learn anything. We continued to realize or think that mistakes were inevitable, that corruption is something you have to accept, that nobody needs to be much concerned over the welfare of other people. Well, many ways we can't change this. We cannot prevent 
all these things from happening. Well, there are two things we can do. One is to make the adjustment within ourselves which will clear our own magnetic field. The fact that many people are wrong doesn't make our wrong right. And if the individual cleanses his own inner life, the inside of his own cup, he will find that his adjustment with society will be greatly improved. No one is going to really worry much because he lives a little better, but they will worry a great deal if he talks about being better and continues to be worse. It is therefore quite possible for us to so build our personal lives that we can uh, be, earn the integrities and securities that were given to us in the beginning. We are told that no matter how many fall to the right or the left, the just man shall not be moved. The just person is protected by his own justice because he keeps the rules. By doing this, he cleanses his own private stable. He cleanses his own inner life and can be uh, able, and will be able to live a normal and reasonable existence and be ready for greater advancements and greater opportunities in lives to come. He is all, he is going to be all right. And the second thing he can do without they are really endangering anybody is to try in his own outer conduct uh, to keep the rules of decency, the rules of nature, to live as far as he can harmlessly. No one can be completely harmless, but we can reduce our harmfulness to such an extreme minimum that it will save us most of the miseries with which we are now afflicted. All the way along, we have to do these things. We also have to be as careful as we can be in the handling of the materials by means of which the earth itself is polluted. We have to try to protect the hygiene and we have to practice highly civilized eugenical procedures. We have to keep everything as near as possible in a simple but reasonable condition. We have to try not to destroy the helpfulness of an environment, to litter the parks, to throw bottles out of car windows, and to do all kinds of foolish things. And we must not commit the greatest follies probably of the moment, and that is to try to drive an automobile while under the influence of alcohol. All of these things are contrary to laws, and not only man-made, for man-made laws are often ineffective and quite frequently incomplete. Uh, but laws of common sense to prevent the perpetuation of tragedies which will continue. As more and more people become aware of these facts, a new element will come into the magnetic field. When a person suddenly discovers some of the spiritual values of life, some of the integrities, and begins to experience the beauty of inner, inner normalcy and maturity, the magnetic field is influenced. Every gland, every cell, every molecule, every atom feels the marvelous force of improved consciousness. And that is, in a sense, how for the little cells in our body, our own enlightenment makes a world teacher of us as far as they are concerned. We will have the power to guide the parts of our own body into a greater conformity with truth itself. All over the world today, the difficulties that we are passing through are beginning to provide incentives for a better approach to things. All over, groups are rising up, not able politically necessarily to control situations, but to produce better people, to more consecrated forms of conduct, uh, to deeper understanding of the laws governing life. As this process continues, there is every reason to believe that it will largely not neutralize the negative karma that is in the Earth's magnetic field. It will begin to allow the constructive forces of nature to operate. It will not bring about, as has been in the, true in the past, the constant death of the great world light. And to the ancients, the sun was the symbol of the Messiah, the power of life the power of truth, the symbol of hope. 
And we must uh, not only realize that this power nourishes us and sustains us, but that every one of us has a responsibility for it. That we have a responsibility to use every energy that we have as wisely as we can. If we do these things wisely, in a sense we redeem the earth. We redeem the earth when we redeem ourselves, inasmuch as the earth itself has not the type of disposition and problem that we have. But it has the problem. It must bring its own children to maturity. It is the earth itself that must finally provide the material for the salvation of the human soul. Therefore, the earth must be kept clean and pure, and every effort must be made to make sure that it is not corrupted by personal or collective activity. I checked the number of earthquakes over and did a number of charts of them at one time. Some of them are in our journal. And it becomes obvious constantly uh, that it is not simply planetary positions that are involved in these things. In the last four or five years, there have been a dozen doleful predictions of earthquakes. Up to now, they have been comparatively moderate, not much more than usual for the planet. But uh, the constant belief uh, that the uh, earthquakes are, for instance, the result of the heavy weight of planets on one part of the earth or another, so that in the atmosphere a gathering of planets may unbalance the magnetic field of the solar system. Well, I, I don't really buy this too heavily. I feel this way, that if there is a heavy burden of planets, if it is true that there are definite alignments, these are potential causes of something. But these potential causes will not produce their effects unless they operate upon an appropriate medium. If psychologically, mentally, emotionally, physically, geographically, economically, in all these ways, we are all tragically poised on the edge of disaster. It is quite possible that a couple of rays from Jupiter or Saturn might finish off the trick. But if we are not deserving some form of catastrophe, we won't have it. And the catastrophe will be limited to what is necessary to bring to the average human being a greater realization of his own reason for life. Catastrophes carry persons out of incarnation, but catastrophe, catastrophes have never killed a human soul. They have never destroyed. They have merely taken away bodies which for the most part have been abused, misused, and neglected. But if the individual learns through the problem of a tragic disaster and can carry forward into future embodiments the information he has gained, all will be well. If the earth in its present cycle can achieve the normalization of the children upon it so that in a sense there is a cosmic world government, a world government ruled primarily by the spirit of the planet itself and the cooperation of the other members of the solar system. If this is attained, in due course of time the earth spirit will pass to other forms, but it will go on higher and higher through the victories that have been achieved in its own evolutionary program. So everything works together in the long run for good. There is nothing lost. There is no tragic disaster. The nearest thing there is to a disaster in this world is stupidity. It is the fact that people just will not and cannot argue themselves or convert themselves to constructive ways of life. They cannot get over their gossiping. They cannot get over their intrigues, their vanities, their ambitions, their jealousies and fanaticisms. And then as those keep on, the death rate will gradually rise, as it did in antiquity, as there is more and more corruption and less and less uh, corrective factors available. The end of the whole problem is that man must purify the world. And by purifying the world, he accomplishes this by, by purifying himself. And when the world has reached a point where it deserves world peace, it will have it. Where it deserves to be free from natural calamities, it will be free. And if the time comes when there is an earthly paradise, it will certainly be the result of human beings earning it 
by the production of constructive endeavors. The idea that heaven or paradise or anything else that's good will be handed to us simply because we want it is like trying to tell small children that regardless of their conduct, we will take care of them and reward them as well for their misdeeds as their good ones. We cannot do these things and, and, and survive in the pattern of natural law. But when in the course of time we keep the law, magnetic field within ourselves will be very easy to get along with. We will find in it new sensory perceptions that we have not yet discovered. We will find wisdom that we have never even guessed at. And we will come closer and closer to the divine mechanism by means of which the whole life of man and the universe are maintained. Until, however, we ourselves take over the redemption of ourselves, we cannot hope that some vicarious power will take care of it for us. Even if there was such a power, which most people rather doubt, it would be too bad to believe in it, because it would destroy in us the glory of being right in our own right, of doing the thing correctly ourselves, because it is the correct thing to do. Actually looking back over a whole cycle of these earthquakes, it becomes more or less certain uh, that man is more tied up in them than he realizes. Perhaps it isn't all involved in himself. Perhaps there are larger solar factors. But he is certainly doing things that aren't helping. And nuclear warfare certainly is not doing him any good. It is a complete perversion of, na of natural resource. If the powers that are locked within an atom are sufficient to destroy the population of a planet. Rightfully used, those powers can lift that planet to a higher level than it has ever known. The proper use of energies protects the integrities of living things. That the human beings should conceive of the power of the atom should also remind them of the tremendous power for good that is locked in every cell of our own bodies that within us there are millions and millions of potential gods growing up within our own flesh. It is our moral duty to take care of them, guard them, serve them, take the proper parental attitude toward them, because if we neglect them long enough, they'll create an earthquake in us that we won't like. Not because they want to hurt us, but because they are no longer capable of fulfilling their destiny and that which cannot complete the purpose for itself is removed. It is an, given another chance, but if it cannot get out of a present emergency, it must wait for a better opportunity. But each person has a responsibility to his own body. He has a responsibility to body politic. He has a responsibility to the solar system, to the cosmos, to the universe, to the galaxy. It is all part of one chain of life. And it is absolutely necessary that no form of life, no matter how humble, breaks that chain or tries to. That chain must be preserved. For there is not only a great deal high material above the present state, but there is an infinite diversity of that which is below the present level. There are more forms of life that are still below us in evolution than there are above us, perhaps. When we happen to realize that the population of the earth is completely overwhelmed by the number of one single insect that exists. This problem of the, of the broken chain not only damages us, but contributes to the detriment of every form of life below our own. The minerals, the plants, the vegetables, the animals. The molecular, all these things are damaged when we break the chain of integrities. And wherever the breaking of the chain takes place, there is a shuddering in space. There is an emergency. There is a condition which requires drastic treatment. And if this drastic treatment, it takes the form of earthquakes or other natural catastrophes, catastrophes they can all be traced to some type of a state that man himself makes and perpetuates in his society. Long ago, there was a very serious flood in China. And the emperor of China uh, wanted to know how to solve it. So he sent for a great architect. And the architect said, Your Majesty, 
the people along the shores of the Yellow River try to protect themselves against floods by putting, building dikes and filling earth bags and making embankments and filling sacks with sand and doing all kinds of things like that to build a wall against the water. It has always failed and it always will. There is only one answer to your problem. Don't make the wall higher. Dig the bed of the river deeper so that the walls of the, the natural wall of the river will protect the communities. And within our lives, there's no use building more and more defenses against the problems we face. Instead of building excuses and trying in one way or another to exonerate ourselves from our own natural infirmities, let us not build more defenses against problems, but let's build the bed of the river deeper. Let our own wisdom, our own integrity, enable us to use nature's own way to protect life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. If we will do these things, we will in due time bring about the goals we seek. And uh, today there is a new movement in that direction. There is a great searching and uh, gradually increasing integrities will bring about the restoration of all things. We need this restoration. And until we get it, nature will give us nudges every little while. It will keep on telling us that we're not doing what we should be doing. And as long as we fail, we will be subject to the emergencies, not of an avaricious or a vengeful deity, but the emergencies of a law violated through ignorance or selfishness. So if we work all these things together, I think it will probably come all right in due time. I guess that's all for this morning.